There's a third possibility, okay? To go back to our inequality. Is it possible for the corporation to get a new source of revenue, okay, which would help fund, say, a, a, an investment uh, expansion or higher rents or higher tax, taxes? Yes. The corporation could borrow money. So the corporation can go out and try and you know, issue bonds and, and, and get money to cover this crisis. But if it borrows money, say to expand an accumulation or new investment and so forth in plant and equipment, it's got to repay the debt plus an interest on the debt. So we have something new on the right hand side, which is a payment to bankers. Because bankers are a subsumed class who take their money and they lend it, one of the things they do, they lend it to industrial corporations for the debt so that corporations can help finance their uh, payments to subsumed subsume classes above and beyond that warranted by the surplus or the gross profit the corporation has received. Okay? But then you might say, well, my goodness, if I've added this to the right-hand side, the repayment of the debt and the interest, isn't it possible I have a new inequality? And the answer is yes. Yes. Because as you know, the debt has to be repaid plus interest on the debt. So yes, the debt covers this, but then over time, you got to repay the debt and the interest. And so the calculation is on this borrowing that you've done initially, that debt, Will that somehow, in some way, enhance this over time now, enhance this over time, so that the new surplus that the, the board of directors receives will be high enough to repay the debt, repay the interest on the debt, cover all of its new subsumed classes? And that kind of, of uh, uh, calculation is the comparison between the interest on the debt and the productivity of the debt. And the productivity of the debt here is how it enhances the surplus over time. That's something else the Board of Directors has to consider. Now in your reading, that's, this is complex, interesting, that's, that's a class analysis of, of, of a capitalist society. In your reading, um, you have been assigned class analyses of other kinds of societies. Marx discusses what I'm going to call the big five, capitalism, feudalism, <coughs> the ancient slave communism. He discusses a variety of others as well. But those are the ones that he spends the most uh, time with. Um, and the most time spent of those five are, are you know, obviously in capitalism. So I presented to you readings on, on uh, if I remember correctly, readings on, on each of these. And And you've got to bear in mind the commonalities and the differences amongst these class, these different class structures. First, very briefly, we have the surplus labor in capitalism. So surplus labor, bracket, capitalism. That's the form in which the surplus is produced and appropriated. And that's distributed, all these different subsumed class payments, to secure its non-class structure, capitalism. We also have a surplus labor in feudalism, F denotes feudalism, distributed for all the non-class processes that exist in feudalism. The big five, ancient, slave, And let's take the last one, communism. What's the commonality here? What's, what's similar? What's similar across all these societies is that surplus labor is produced in, in, in each of them. Because, as again, you can't have a society without this social glue holding it together and the surplus enables that social glue to 
to occur by subsumed classes on the right-hand side producing the non-class processes enabling the left-hand side to exist in these respective societies. So there's a commonality, class exploitation occurs in one, two, three, four, but because the workers both collectively produce and appropriate the surplus, there's no class exploitation here, defined in the sense that the workers are receiving the surplus that the workers produce, which is not the case in the others. You can understand why Marx favored communism over these others. Just, just a footnote on that, however. On this ancient, in your, your reading, you're going to read about this. this. What the ancient is, is the same individual that produces the surplus also appropriates it. Sometimes it's called in the Marxian tradition the petty mode of, of, of production. What it really, really is is individual appropriation. So they hear the worker doesn't work for anybody and nobody works for the worker. Okay? So there is a similarity between the ancient and the communist. The worker in the ancient, the singular worker, appropriates his or her own surplus. In communism, the collectivity of the workers produce the surplus, which the same collectivity appropriates. So I have to go back, I have to be a bit more careful here. Here there is, if you want, self-exploitation. Here there is collective exploitation. But, you know, this is being cute. In the ancient, the same individual exploits him herself, whereas in communism, the collectivity of workers exploit themselves. Whereas in capitalism, feudalism, slavery, that is quite different. There the workers produce a respective surplus, but a different group, capitalists, lords, masters, appropriate the surplus received. Okay? But, so there's a similarity of surplus. The forms of the surplus differ. The forms of the surplus differ because there are different non-class structures in these different societies which literally constitute, create these different forms of the surplus. So in capitalism, there's a set of laws, a set of politics, a set of uh, culture and economics which is different from that of, say, feudalism. And that difference shows up by having a different surplus form in capitalism than in feudalism. But, in your, your, again, in your readings, you go through in, in uh, uh, some detail um, how and why these different uh, class structures uh, uh, compare to one another. Um, and, that, that, you know, that's a fascinating um, uh, analysis that Marx presents us in order to understand the similarities and differences amongst these different societies. One last comment on this. Is it possible to have a society in which more than one, perhaps even all of these uh, five class structures exist at one and the same time? Yes. Yes. So one could use this class analysis to begin to reconceptualize the history of any country. For example, in the United States, um, over time, it's quite possible to have all of these class structures coexisting and then, of course, competing, contending, conflicting with one another, sometimes perhaps even going to war. So in the United States, over our history, we start out in the States, you know, uh, during colonial times, in which we have all of these class structures uh, uh, present in the States, perhaps the most important being the ancient, the ancient farmer, uh, the ancient uh, 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 manufacturer in the urban areas producing shoes and so forth etc the farmer um, owning his or her own land and producing crops beginning of capitalism a wage labor system perhaps we also had uh, feudalism in the sense of the bond servants in Pennsylvania and upper state New York Maryland certainly slavery in the American South and of course the American Indian nations some anthropologists claim, some historians claim that that was a kind of collective society in which the, the Indian tribe, the nation, both produced and appropriated the surplus as a collectivity. Well, then you can begin to do all kinds of, once you establish and argue this, all kinds of interesting uh, new histories uh, uh, for the United States in which, uh, let me just give you one of many examples. The state in the United States then would be providing Remember, the state would be on the right-hand side here. The state would be providing different conditions of existence for these different class structures to survive. So, for example, in the United States, the state would have to be providing the laws and the economics and the culture, let's say, for slavery and for capitalism. Well, that means this is 
weird, bizarre, but it's part of U.S. history. Part of the law would say that workers are free to sell their labor power. Part of the laws in slavery would say certain kinds of workers are not free to sell their labor power because they're slaves, they're things, they're not human beings, and hence human beings can sell their labor power, capitalism, but things can't sell their labor power, slavery. So the state is providing two different kinds of, of laws there in the same society. One law says that some people are free. Uh, the, uh, other laws say that other people are not free. You can see that that's a conflict, a contradiction, that in fact in the United States, not just because of that, but other things as well, we're going to go to war over that. The state also, let's take another one. Thomas Jefferson could be a champion of the ancients. The idea here that uh, 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 the kind of democracy that we have in the United States um, was both a cause and an effect of this ancient society. Whereas, say, Alexander Hamilton could be a champion of capitalism and deeply worried about, um, unless we protect these uh, small growing uh, capitalists, um, they're going to be overwhelmed by the more competitive, more efficient uh, British capitalists of the day. And, and if we don't do something to help the, the, the uh, 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 capitalists, then despite we have our freedom, we just fought a war, we're free of, of, of uh, uh, colonialism, we'll end up de facto as a kind of economic colony of Britain because um, they will outcompete us. So we need for Hamilton a tariff placed on British goods which will enable the young uh, industrial capitalists in the United States to grow. So the state is to provide a new condition of existence. We'll get a tax for doing that, new condition of existence, which would be a tariff. Him, uh, Jefferson comes back and says, no, no, that tariff is going to discriminate against these ancient farmers because they're going to have to pay higher prices for their tools and equipment than they would otherwise. And so in order to have a strong, thriving ancient, we don't want a tariff. Hamilton says, we need a tariff. You can see what's going to happen here. You can have a struggle in the state over this particular uh, political process of, of a tariff. And we can reproduce this again and again um, throughout U.S. history. So, in your reading, in your syllabus, you're assigned um, some very interesting uh, readings on these different class structures. Please read them. Understand how each functions and how it, that functioning of each is different from the others. The next time around then, we're going to uh, make use of this class analysis to begin to understand Marx's greatest work, Capital.